How are you? Great. Turn off all cell phones, pagers, camera speakers, space heaters, recorder monitors, blenders, blackberries, blenders, blenders. Um, today's date 11. We got a road story. Fantastic. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the DOD briefing room again. As you all know, I'm Colonel Keck here in the press room, and uh, we have with us today the privilege of uh, having Brigadier General John Tulin, who is the principal deputy or principal principal director for South and Southeast Asia in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. General Tulin is here today to provide us an update on counterterrorism efforts in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, he probably has a short opening statement, and then he can take your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn directly over to General Tulin. Sir? Well, first of all, I'm really uh, glad to have, have this opportunity to get some of the word out, um, specifically as being the principal director uh, of uh, South and Southeast Asia. I've had the opportunity now to spend a lot of time in uh, that part of the world. Um, and if I thought that there were two major themes of our effort, uh, the first uh, theme is that our national interest and our national health lays squarely in Asia uh, from not only economic perspectives but from a security perspective. But unfortunately, I think that the war in Iraq and Afghanistan has drawn so much attention that some of our allies and friends in uh, Asia and Southeast Asia and South Asia in particular believe that we aren't spending the time, the quality time that's necessary to build those interests and build those relationships. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and exactly how we are doing that. And uh, the second point is something that's really critically important. Some people talk about this concept of whack-a-mole. You know, you take care of a problem in one part of the world and the problem will pop up someplace else. And what we have really established, particularly through the efforts of the COCOMs, but with the policy directives coming from OSD, is a, is a, is a concept of, of attacking the war on terrorism from a global perspective. And so what I'd like to do is highlight just a couple of the things that uh, our commanders uh, and our friends in State Department and USAID and the whole uh, quiver of uh, tools that the U.S. government has at its disposal to address the issues of terrorism around the world. Um, I think if I had to title this opportunity to talk to the press and to get the word out, I would say that uh, it's all about winning in Asia and the Pacific region. And when I say winning, I'm talking about winning the peace. Um, South Southeast Asia has, has, has emerged quietly, but yet it's a crucial front in the long war. Um, we are looking at attacking the issues on terrorism in uh, South and Southeast Asia by building partnership capacity. In fact, as part of the QDR, one of the key elements that came out of that was the whole issue of building partnership capacity. And each region has a responsibility to work using the various funds that are at the, the disposal of the combatant commanders and as well as State Department to uh, <clears throat> look at what is needed and then help them build that capacity. We have used the term the indirect approach as being the, the, the method by which we build partnership capacity. We believe that certainly that a unilateral approach, approach on the part of the U.S. is not the right answer. 
we've learned from experience that having large footprints is, a, is problematic. Uh, and so our effort is to, using the lessons learned, using the experience and the talents that are available uh, to the U.S., to then impart those capabilities upon our friends and allies in, in uh, South and Southeast Asia and allow them to do the job. And by the indirect approach, I also mean being able to use some of our key allies in Asia and working with them and through them to then help build capacity and capability uh, within South and Southeast Asia. For example, uh, we in Asia have five primary allies. You know Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, Thailand, and these allies that we have have uh, some tremendous capability. And working with them, we then indirectly improve the capabilities of our other allies in Southeast Asia, such as Thailand, excuse me, such as uh, uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., cetera, uh, Sri Lanka. So this indirect approach is not only just training and, and emphasizing the capabilities of the, uh, our uh, friends in South and Southeast Asia, but also working indirectly through some of our key allies in Asia. And we're also using some of the regional fora that's available. The ASEAN regional forum is becoming uh, a key interlocutor with uh, some of our Southeast Asian uh, allies to work through on a regional perspective and help build capacity, uh, help join hands. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. We think that this indirect approach will and eventually uh, over a long-term effort, address some of the root causes of terrorism. Uh, the, we know that uh, terrorism really is, is, in many ways, a result of uh, the quality of life and the level of security that people have uh, uh, within their own national boundaries. And we believe that using USAID and State Department diplomacy, et cetera, uh, that we can uh, address these root causes. And, and then, most importantly, help reduce the recruiting of, of terrorists uh, and uh, insurgents uh, throughout South and Southeast Asia. As a result of the uh, QDR, I think you, you know that one of the key elements that came out of that is that we must have a program that counters the ideological support to terrorism. And so and when, we, when we talk about root causes, I mean, that is actually what is the nexus behind our efforts is to get at those ideological uh, support to terrorism. Um, so how are we going to do this, promote stability and security? I mean, one, obviously, is promoting economic development uh, to help shape the conditions for good governance and, and rule of law, and then finally to organize, train, and equip local security forces, which we have found certainly is a, an essential ingredient in the efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, we also understand, as I, as I mentioned earlier, through this indirect approach, being able to provide that capability to all those nations in Southeast Asia that are dealing with or potentially could deal with terrorism. Um, the key in many ways is to provide institutional change. Um, we have right currently right now in Southeast Asia two major, or in Asia, two major efforts on defense reform initiatives. One is going on in Mongolia, and the other one is, is currently been in, you know, ongoing in Philippines for about two years. Uh, the Philippine Defense Reform Initiative is, is, is a major effort uh, to look at everything in the defense department at, in the, within the Philippines. Uh, specifically, we are uh, taking a look at their budgeting process as well as taking a look at their professional development. Um, from professional development, we're talking about not only education, but we're also talking about ethics, et cetera, ethics in, in, uh, in combat environments, um, et cetera. <clears throat> the, uh, 
The institutional reform is a process that we, we initiate through our defense resource management system here at OSD. We send out experts to the country. The country opens up its uh, defense department, allows us to take a good hard look at their budgeting process, their acquisition process, their policies and directives, and then help them sort of reformulate them so that they have a very um, workable defense organization that uh, has good objectives and a good vision, and, and then uh, we, we let them take off. And in the Philippines, we're seeing that right now. Um, specifically, as many of you know, in the Philippines, uh, over the past three months, they have captured three of the key Abu Saif leadership, uh, and uh, they're pushing them further and further away from their home bases in areas like Holo and Tawi Tawi, and they're pushing them even further out into the uh, uh, neighboring countries uh, in and around uh, Malaysia and the Sabah and uh, in Indonesia, which is a very positive thing because, as I spoke earlier, as we look to the uh, regional forum, uh, things like maritime security is allowing the Indonesians and the Malaysians to work and cooperate with the Philippines uh, to identify potential safe havens for these terrorists and keep the pressure on. I think, um, I think with that I'll probably, uh, I'll probably end and, and uh, leave an opportunity for you to, to ask uh, some questions. Um, yes, Pam. Uh, could you talk about the threat in Asia and how it relates to what we know of uh, Al Qaeda or in the Middle East? Um, when we talk about the global war on terrorism, it tends to create the notion of a kind of a single terrorist threat that's all linked. And what, what's your understanding of who these groups are, what their linkages are, how many there are, and um, what impact I don't know they have in other parts of the world? Well, you know, it's, I mean, I think I think the the uh, many people would look at uh, terrorism and, and immediately they would uh, associate the terrorist activities with this Islamist extremist views that are uh, been percolating all over the world. Um, there are some there are some significant perceptions that need to be overcome in in, in Asia. For example, uh, uh, many of you may know the story of the Burnhams, and when the Burnhams talked about their capture, they said, you know, and they, of course they were very well uh, educated on, uh, you know, theocracy and 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 religion and. They said, you know, these terrorists didn't even understand the Quran. They had no concept of uh, the Islamic religion. So, you, you know, it wasn't necessarily uh, Islamic extremists that were that were taking the lead in the terrorist activities in the Philippines. Um, but what ha what's happening in, percep in perceptions, particularly in the Philippines, is that some of the disingenuous Islamists are looking at the activities in the Philippines and they're saying, well, this is, this is, this is Catholics bashing on Muslims. Uh, it's a similar issue uh, when you look at uh, the insurgency in, in Thailand. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, a good governing body taking a serious incident, uh, interest in the security and stability of that country and, and trying to prevent the insurgency from growing in Malaysia, it's Buddhists versus Muslims. And these are perceptions that need to be overcome because it's not the case. It's the case of, uh, in many ways, thugs and criminals and drug runners and people who just are in a position to uh, yield a little power for a short period of time, and they're trying to create the kind of chaos that they then profit from. And these are governments going after that. Uh, unfortunately, in that network that you're addressing, the problem is, is that there is that Al-Qaeda larger organization that will capitalize on the chaos and the confusion and the criminality that's going on in those countries. And that's, a cha that's the challenge and that's the problem. How do they capitalize on it? By uh, one, there is, there is funding 
There is uh, transnational uh, shipping of supplies and munitions, and, and those things are being addressed, as I spoke earlier about the, some of our maritime security initiatives uh, from a regional perspective. So, sir. So just two questions, really. How does, how does China play in your calculations in Southeast Asia? And second, I, I, under, I understand there's an exercise going on with the United States Navy in India. How close are the relationships between the United States and India, and how does that influence the operations in Southeast Asia? Those are big, 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 big questions, big countries. Certainly you can't uh, talk about anything that we do in Southeast Asia without considering China, because China is, as well, a very interested in the stability and security of Asia as the United States are. And I believe as, uh, that uh, the U.S.'s position is to maintain and continue to work with China to increase the level of stability and security in Asia. With that said, um, the U U.S. is continually uh, engage with China on, on activities that we are involved in in Southeast Asia. For example, um, even closer to home, uh, some of the activities that are going on in Mongolia as we're trying to build uh, a peacekeeping, a large enough peacekeeping uh, force worldwide to address what we know in the next coming three, four years will be exorbitant numbers of peacekeepers that will be required uh, throughout the world. I think the UN estimated 80,000 peacekeepers will be required by 2010. So we're on a major effort to try and certify and grow and train and build peacekeepers. Our efforts in Mongolia raised the, the eyebrows of the Chinese. Is what, what are we doing? But in discussion with the Chinese about exactly what the initiative was, and the initiative is Global Peacekeeping Operations Initiative, which uh, currently is being well-funded by the United States, and Mongolia is a key recipient of that, is to build peacekeepers. And, and when, once that was understood, China said, okay, makes sense. Uh, and I just want to address the India question. I mean, India is certainly uh, a partner with the United States. Slowly but surely, that relationship is continuing to grow and build. Um, the efforts, and you have to understand that also, I'm sure you do, that India is the largest democracy in the world, and that there is a natural relationship between India and the U.S. And so, as we look at that wide open sea, and the area that is particularly around the what we call the terrorist triangle in around the Sulu Sulawesi Sea, I mean having uh, India's uh, capability from naval capability to help address the security in those oceans is is of great importance. You you've talked in general about the importance of the region and what you say is the the fight against terror there. Um, I'm wondering. Do you, th you know, is there any additional money for this, for training and exercises, um, not only at the Pentagon, but at AID and state, or, you know, are you suggesting there, there should be more money? If you could talk about hmm. programs, money, and need for any joint exercises, that kind of thing. Um, there, as I just mentioned, GPOI, which is the Global Peacekeeping Operation Initiative, that, that budget is uh, fairly substantial. It's about... I'm, 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 I think it's about $2 million a year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when we're talking about the training peacekeepers, that does a pretty good job. Uh, additionally, last year, the Defense Def Department was authorized what we call 1206 funding, which is additional monies that was set aside specifically for uh, helping to build capacity uh, regarding counterterrorism. And it runs the gamut of not only tactical capabilities, you know, night vision, training, et cetera, but it also talks about civil military operations and engineering efforts to rebuild roads. That 1206 funding additionally is going towards a large piece of it. I'm going to say $40 million. Uh, $12 million, for example, just went to uh, uh, Malaysia to help them build a maritime surveillance capability in the Sulu-Sulawesi Sea. We, in the next year, we will have tied 
four of those countries in Southeast Asia together with significant surveillance capability that we will be able to know what's transiting those, those uh, waterways, which we are well aware of is, is being used for a variety of different illegal things, from munitions to drugs to personnel, people, et cetera. So the 1206 funding has been a major effort. And then, uh, of course, finally, uh, in foreign assistance, um, there has been a draw uh, uh, on foreign assistance from State Department. How however, recently, State Department has reorganized their funding processes. And uh, we're right now in the middle, actually, of uh, fine-tuning exactly what we will be providing to each country. But we still are funding in, in throughout Southeast Asia, IMET, which is a, a way of really building that professional military education that was, I was talking about. For example, uh, you know that in Indonesia, only two, in 2005, a year and a half ago, we really uh, um, re-engaged with Indonesia. They, since 97, uh, they've basically not had anybody go to our schools. Well, we've, we've refunded that, and now they're, they're coming to our schools uh, through the IMED program. And it's a great opportunity to really sit and talk with them about values and ethics, et cetera. You watch this more closely than anyone. I mean, is there, are there any programs that need more money, more emphasis? Yes. I think that uh, there's always a need for more money, and I would start with the IMED programs. Um, there, and throughout my travels, one of the first things that I am, I am uh, bombarded with is, can we get more quotas to your schools? Because <clears throat> they know that that's where they're going to get a good quality education. And in addition, it also provides a method of a way of, of sort of standardizing procedures and understanding in that region if they're educated centrally. Um, so that is certainly an area that we could use more of. How much is being spent? How much more do you think should be spent on that? Um, for example, I would say, uh, what, what are we spending in Thailand? Uh, this year we're not spending any. Uh, okay, thank you. $26 million was provided to Thailand last year. Um, I think that we could easily double that and be able to, uh, they'd still be able to fill the school seats uh, as, that were available. So, um, why is there money in this the, um, In uh, September uh, 19th, in fact, uh, there was a coup in Thailand. And based on uh, legislation that uh, Congress wrote in, uh, if there's a coup and it's, uh, it's looked upon as being undemocratic, then all funding would be uh, canceled. Until sort of go to the problem, though, that we had with Indonesia. In other words, by not having their officers at our schools, we missed a generation, missed being able to influence a generation of Indonesian officers. And isn't it, shouldn't there be another way to maybe express our displeasure with the, these uh, regimes? Um, that, that was a generation of officers 10 years, uh, or actually, I guess, yeah, 10 years. And um, we're just getting those Indonesians back into our schoolhouses. And, and I think it was a significant loss. Um, the... But obviously, the other side of the coin is is that uh, when we talk about human rights, uh, there's any nation that stands at the top as far as protecting human rights. It's our nation, it's our country, and uh, uh, our Congress uh, watches that closely, and that's their way of managing that problem. Um, we hope and we believe that, uh, for example, in Thailand. Uh, the current uh, government is going to be able to uh, get uh, elections restarted, and we will be able to restart funding um, shortly. Yeah. Someone from this building, I think it was on Capitol Hill recently, held up the Philippines as sort of a model for how the U.S., I think, should be deploying in the war on terror. Is, is that true? Is there a model? Is that the place? And are you talking, is that because of the footprint or the activities you were talking about, like the partnerships? You know, right. Shouldn't uh, actually, um, I think it was Admiral Fallon during his testimony uh, when he was being uh, um, 
considered for the CENTCOM job is he used Philippines as an example of that indirect approach that I was just talking about, where now since 2002, actually, um, the United States has been involved in, in efforts to help train the, uh, the uh, Philippine forces, armed forces. And since 2002 uh, to, to today, the Abu Saif, which was really a Islamic-related terrorist group, but I, more along the lines of what I spoke about earlier is more criminal-related than truly uh, is, is Islamist. They uh, are on the run. Uh, areas like Mindanao, which was a safe haven for Abu Saif, uh, I re just a couple of months ago uh, went anywhere I, I wanted to go. Uh, I think uh, the ambassador to the Philippines, Ambassador Kenny, goes down there all the time. Uh, four years ago, that, that didn't happen. Uh, and, and slowly but surely, more and more of those areas. But more importantly is that the economic development in Mindanao and Holo and and we're working our way further south, uh, is just tremendous. People are, people are employed. People are happy. They're working. So uh, the economy is uh, the economic aspect, and that's, I think, was, the, was the, the point, is that there are no kinetic solutions to this problem. It's, it's all non-kinetic, and if you look at what the Philippine Armed Forces is doing, first of all, Years past, the Philippine Armed Forces may have been regarded as a little bit heavy-handed. If you see what they're doing now, they, are, they understand civil military operations, and they are effectively working on it. So it's a positive step, and that's, I think, the reason why the Philippines was used as an example. Since you recently came back from there, can you identify what you would say is the most immediate pressing threat in that region? On fire, whether it's a particular group. I, th I think I think that we're not there yet regarding regional cooperation. We are very close on bilateral operations. Uh, you know, U.S. working with Indonesia, U.S. working with Thailand, Australians working with Indonesians. You know, Japanese are are engaged down there. But what we haven't been able to do is bring it completely together in a multilateral picture. And that is, that is our vision in the next couple of years. And as I mentioned earlier, I talked about that terrorist triangle uh, in and around the Sulu, Sulu ACC. I mean, it was a, it's been a wide open expanse that is uh, we call ungoverned space. We are trying to find a way to govern it, and the only way it can be done is through the, is through the efforts of the countries that border uh, the Sulu and Sulu ACC. So indirectly, we're helping and assisting and providing maritime technology, surveillance capabilities, et cetera. If we can get a handle on that, we will stop the trafficking, or they will stop the trafficking with our assistance, and that's key. Maybe one or two more? Um, yeah. General, could you defend your opening statement where you said that U.S. national security is, is linked to this area? I think we understand the economic engine that's over there, but where's the security link? I think um, as we look at the Asian region, um, if we don't stay involved, if we don't stay engaged, nature abhors a vacuum and it will be filled by someone else. And certainly we know that the markets in that part in, in Asia are critical to our economic health in the United States. So. We want to maintain those relationships, continue to build upon them, uh, and help break down some of the negative perceptions about, uh, about the U.S. and, and, and it, the impression that uh, we sometimes do things uh, unilaterally. And I don't know if I made that one clear enough, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, you take your pick, but certainly, uh, you know, China's uh, uh, blossoming. I mean, they, they need markets and they need resources. And, and just like any nation in their own national interest, they're going to try and find um, ways to bring those resources to that country and allow it to continue to grow at 10% a year. So, 
you see China as a competitor in that regard rather than a I see, cooperative element? I, I see. Uh, I see China as being as being a competitor. I, I, I mean, I think India has got a certain. Uh, I mean, India has got a look east uh, policy as well, and uh, so everybody is competing for resources. Everybody's competing for markets. Uh, I think Adam Smith uh, was very correct in saying that you know there's an invisible hand out there that everybody's competing in order to grow, and that's that's what I see. Competition. Yes. Maybe one more. Do you, I don't know how long you've been traveling back and forth to this region, but have you seen the United States increase, it, you talk about the negative perception of the United States, do you feel that people see the United States in worse light now than they did maybe four, five, six years ago? As I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think that there is a perception that the United States is, is distracted uh, by Iraq and Afghanistan. And you know, my mandate, and certainly in my office's objective, is to, one, make sure that we are out there, we are looking at their issues, we're addressing their issues. That's why the funding is important, and to make sure that we're continuing to uh, provide what they need and what they want. Um, but there is that perception that we're distracted, and so our efforts are to uh, give as much as possible through this indirect approach, as I mentioned, so that um, they'll continue to want to work with us. And I didn't mention much also about South Asia, but uh, I just recently was in Sri Lanka. Actually, the day I arrived, the day, it was uh, 10 minutes before the airport was uh, bombed by those uh, LTTE Cessna aircraft. And, you know, the first thing that the Secretary of Defense said to me afterwards was, can you help us? Can you help us with our air defense? Absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we certainly will do that. And uh, we're in the business of helping you help yourself. So uh, as long as we continue to work with these, these countries in South and Southeast Asia to help them maintain security, um, I think we'll all benefit uh, in the long run. All right. Thanks. Thanks.